So let's continue with the lecture. This time we're going to talk about uh, private health coverage. And we should start that by understanding the mechanisms of health insurance because private health coverage is basically private health insurance. Before we do that though, let's examine the, the ratio of insured and uninsured in the type of coverage that the total population of the United States have uh, as of 2017. And this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation website. In this column, you will see the different types of coverage people have. In this column would be the number of people that have uh, that fall under such category. And this would be the percentage. So notice that in here, this is a total population of the United States. It's around 317 uh, million, uh, 22,500. And of course, that's an estimate as well. And of course, because this is our universe or the denominator that is 100%. Now, the biggest portion of coverage, which is almost half, 49% um, of the population is covered by employer-based health insurance. There's, they're also called groups. Group insurance because they are grouped into risk pools. We talked about risk pool earlier uh, by the employers that sponsor that health insurance. Now, there is this thing called non-group, which is private health insurance as well, coverage, but these are people that buy their own health insurance. And this would include people that buy their health insurance through the marketplaces as stipulated by the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. That's about 7% of the population. The second biggest coverage group is Medicaid. So about 21% of the population actually receives coverage from Medicaid. That includes the state child health insurance plan and we will talk more about that in a little bit and then that's followed by Medicare which is for the elderly and those that have certain forms of disabilities and then uh, about 1% is covered by other public coverages that includes TRICARE or Veterans Affairs for the military and about 9% of the population which is about 28 million Americans do not have health coverage. Now, this was greatly reduced after the Affordable Care Act, and you could uh, look at the difference if you actually look at where the gains were in terms of gaining coverage, they fall on the non-group because most of these people got in here uh, through Obamacare. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So before uh, the marketplaces came into effect there were about 50 million Americans so who were uh, who didn't have any coverage at all and it went down as of 2017 to less than 30 million so we have actually given access to more than 20 million Americans uh, in terms of having health care coverage So private health coverage covers mostly the non-elderly and the reason for this and why is that is because private health coverage is predominantly the one that is sponsored by the employer. Therefore, if it's people who, that are still working, that means they are below 65 years old and they get their coverage because they're not a retirement age, they get their coverage through their employer. Now, the marketplace and parents' coverage for young adults, uh, as of March 2015, added about 16.4 million Americans among the roles of those having healthcare coverage. That includes almost 6 million young adults that got their coverage through their parents. Private health coverage is provided and regulated by two entities. One is the one sponsored by the, the covered or regulated by the state. They're called the state licensed health insuring organizations. And then the second one are the, the self-funded employee health benefit plans. Now they are governed by the federal government. State licensed health insuring organizations, as I have said, are organized and regulate, regulated under state law. The federal government has additional standards, but it's usually whichever of the two organizations have more stringent rules 
So say, for instance, if the federal government has a more stringent rule, that's the one that's being followed in terms of regulating these organizations. So let's talk about the different types of state licensed health insurance organizations. The first type is what we call commercial health insurers. These are the for-profit, again, I repeat, these are the for-profit health insurance companies. They are for-profit because they are stock companies in which the stocks are owned by stockholders, meaning at the end of the revenue period, these stockholders uh, get dividends out of the profit that the company has made. So mutual insurance companies operate like this as well, but the difference between mutual insurance companies is that whoever has a policy or is a subscriber or is a plan member also automatically becomes an owner um, or a stockholder of the company. So a perfect example for this would be Aetna. The next type of state licensed health insurance organization uh, is what we call the Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans. We talked extensively about the origin of Blue Cross and Blue Shield and how they actually laid out the groundwork for how payment systems are set up for uh, healthcare finance in the United States. So it started off as hospital insurance as Blue Cross and then about 10 years later, um, Blue Shield was formed. And originally they were nonprofit organizations and they were regulated by uh, state laws through the state hospitals and the state medical associations for Blue Shield. Because remember, it was the state medical Associa Associa association excuse me, of California that started Blue Shield. Today, they have merged. Uh, as of 1974, they merged together. And they are now Blue Cross and Blue Shield because they were separate before. And today, the organization uh, could be different across states. Some still operate under state laws. Some are organized almost like commercial health insurers. Now, if you notice, this is by state because they, they say Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New York, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Jersey, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Connecticut. So they are uh, basically organized and regulated state by state. The next type of state licensed health insurance organization is HMO. Again, this is perhaps the most popular or we have heard so much about. And they are licensed under state laws in order for them to operate in one particular state. We will talk more about health maintenance organizations in a little later um, as we go on through the lecture. But this is where the network is very important. So basically this is managed care and it tightly uh, integrates the third party payer source, which is the insurance company, and they are the ones that manage your care, meaning they will only allow you to see providers that are within or that are listed within the network. So if you have a, an HMO, you are actually required to choose a primary care provider that is within the network, and then uh, a perfect example of this would be Kaiser Permanente. So that's it. Let's move on to self-funded employee health benefit plans. These are the health coverages that uh, union members get. So if you are 1199, for instance, uh, your health care coverage through your union is regulated by federal law. And the health benefit arrangements are sponsored by your union and your employer. So your union collects your union dues, and that would include your your uh, contribution to your premium. Now your employers give that money uh, to your union to basically uh, operate or have an overview or oversight of your healthcare coverage. Um, sometimes the union contracts out with an HMO to provide a service. Sometimes the union itself owns its own HMO. And the good thing about union coverage, union health insurance coverage, is that usually there is no cost to the member. There are no co-pays, no deductibles whatsoever, no co-insurance. So for those of you who have 1199 coverage, you are very much aware of that. Now, it also depends um, whether you, your status as of employment, whether you're full-time or part-time. Okay, now we need to talk about 
health plans or what we call private health plans. But before we proceed, I want to explain the difference between health insurance and health plans. Health insurance are the companies that sell the health plans. So health plans are something that you might call as their insurance package. So that's the type of health plan that say uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield will have for Medicaid patients. So a health plan is literally the product that is being sold or marketed by the health insurance company. So that's the main difference. The health insurance company or health insurance is different because health insurance is basically your coverage, but the plan, health plan, is the one that stipulates the type of coverage that you have. So let's look at the different types of health plans. The first one is the different types of managed care plans. So the first one is an HMO. It's a health maintenance organization. This is based on capitated charges. So that means the provider gets a certain amount of payment for each member per month. So set a set monthly fee. This is very tightly organized into managed care. That's why it's an HMO. Uh, that means you need to choose a primary care provider within the network that is specified by the, by the health plan. And if needed, your PCP will be your gatekeeper. Uh, they will be the ones to approve referrals to secondary and tertiary care. Okay, so let's give an example of how this works. How this works is that if you have an HMO, the PCP that you choose is given a capitated fee or reimbursement for you every month. Whether you use the chart, you use the services or not, the provider will still get that capitated fee. So the provider then is incentivized to utilize resources properly because they get a set amount of fee. If you do get a lot of services, they might end up not being paid for because there is a fixed capitated fee for you as a plan member. The next type of private, private health plan we're going to talk about is the PPO, the Preferred Provider Organization. In here, the health plan has an arrangement with PCPs and subspecialists who agree to accept lower fees. In return, by agreeing with that, they become part of the preferred provider organization that the health plan will contract out with. Uh, one good thing about this is that the member can self-refer to a specialist within the network or outside a network. You might have a higher copay if you do that or maybe a higher coinsurance if that is what you intend to do. So PPO is, yes, there is going to be a network, but the way these people are paid is that they are actually paid each time you come, but it's going to be discounted fees. Now, remember, when we talked about this, it's capitated. It's a set amount, whether you use it or not. In PPO, providers get paid it's fee for service arrangement. Each time you come and you're given a healthcare service, they do get paid. However, they agree to a discounted amount of payment. The next one is point of service plan. So this one has a higher premium and may have a higher copay. The good thing about POS, although it's really expensive, is that it allows you the flexibility to use the provisions of an HMO or a PPO, depending on the situation. So if, say, for instance, your child has a special kind of disorder and there is only one expert in your community or in your neighborhood that uh, could provide a specific care or a specialized care, um, if you have an HMO, well, too bad because you can't see that provider if the provider is not within the network. Well, if it's in the network, then well and good. But if not, there's really nothing much you can do about that. But remember, with a PPO, you could self-refer and you can go to, an, to a provider outside of your network. So in this case, you're going to invoke the provisions of the PPO so that you could see and still see that provider. 
If you choose, and you have a point of service plan, if you, if you choose to use the provisions of the HMO, what's really good about it, sorry about that, what's really good about it is that your copays or your out-of-pocket is going to be almost zero or none at all or really cheap. But this gives you the flexibility to go outside of your network too. But then it also gives you the flexibility to literally save money because you can invoke the provisions of HMO with lower out-of-pocket and lower deductibles. Now, of course, BOS, you can see uh, healthcare providers outside of your network. The next type of private health plan is the EPO, or the Exclusive Provider Organization. Just like a POS, this is also a hybrid plan between HMO and PPO, but it goes towards the opposite. So here it's very strict. There is no out-of-network services except in an emergency. If you go out of network, there will be no coverage at all. They will not pay for anything. Now, one good thing about this is that you're not required to choose a primary care provider. It would, of course, we recommend that because for continuity of care, that's pretty good. That's one of the gold standards. You also don't need a referral for subspecialty care, just like a PPO, you can self-refer. And then this is also not capitated. So the providers are paid each time you come and you're given a service. You may have a deductible, a copay, or a coinsurance. We'll talk more about this terminology in a little bit. This has a lower premium, so it's cheaper than a PPO and very little paperwork involved. However, it is very restrictive. Now, EPOs operate ideally within the network of an integrated delivery system because the likelihood of seamless care and continuity of care is right there. So, for instance, Montefiore has an EPO. If this is the type of plan that you have, your EPO provider is Montefiore and you just stay within Montefiore. So again, because it's within one integrated delivery system, there's almost no paperwork at all. For as long as this EPO is accepted in the whole health system, like Mount Sinai, you can go wherever. And it's, it's uh, cheaper than a PPO. It's actually cheaper. Uh, it's almost like the price of an HMO, but it's more restrictive than an HMO. Okay, the next type that we will discuss is what, we, what we call HDHP, High Deductible Health Plan. Now, this is the cheapest of them all. It has the lowest contribution, lowest premium from both you, the employee, and from your employer. The problem with this is that your out-of-pocket or your deductible is very high. So how does this work? If your deductible is 2000 for instance, your health plan will not pay any off the cost of your health care until it has reached 2000 for the year. So if, if, for instance, you had to go visit your doctor for, say, uh, a health care maintenance visit and it's like $500, well, if you came in January, your health plan is not going to pay for this until you reach 2000 So this is ideal for people that don't go see doctors that much. And this has to have an option of a health savings account to cover for the deductible. Now let's explain what the health savings account is. So health savings account are also known as health reimbursement accounts and they became available in 2004. The other part of an HSA is the HDHP as we have discussed in the previous slide. So health savings account are pre-tax personal savings account, the funds of which you can use for qualified medical expenses. So you could also use this for a managed care plan, by the way, a PPO, an HMO, uh, that's, that's also allowed. So if you have deductibles and co-pays with your PPO and HMO or even your EPO, you could charge it to your health savings account. But for a high deductible health plan, you should have this because this is supposed to cover that high deductible, uh, which is not covered by your insurance until you reach it. So um, under the Affordable Care Act in 2018, there are certain limits uh, for this. So if 
you're by yourself, you are allowed to spend only up to 6650 for out of pocket. And this is for uh, uh, family, coverage for family. So it also, the law also protects you so that you do not have to spend um, more than this amount. Now, be careful about opening a health savings account because let's use this example for instance. If your deductible is 2000 correct? You would want to open a health savings account that is worth 2000 so that, remember this is pre-tax, so that whatever you set aside as a health savings account will then cover for this $2,000 in the meantime that you have not reached your deductible, which is the time when your health insurance is not yet ready to kick in. Okay, one thing you have to remember though is that this is good because it's pre-tax. That means it could lower your tax bracket. So that means if you earn $50,000 a year, if you set aside $2,000 to cover for your high deductible, in the eyes of the law, and as far as the IRS is concerned, if you set aside a $2,000 as a health savings account, for them, your taxable income is now down to $48,000 because you set aside a $2,000. Now be careful about that $2,000 because why? It is use it or lose it. If by the end of the year you have not used up the $2,000, that is gone forever. You cannot keep it as a savings account. It can. Some plans, uh, health savings account, depending on what you have, which you could also get from your employer, it can get over to the following year. The service, though, should have been given to you within the calendar year, previous calendar year, but you're given until March uh, to basically claim it. Right? So you need to be careful about private health, uh, health savings accounts. The last type of private health plan we'll talk about are what we call conventional health plans. These are also known as indemnity insurance or fee-for-service. Now, the concept behind this is retrospective reimbursement for healthcare services. Very high premium, very expensive. But if you have this and your healthcare provider accepts it, the insurance company, uh, in good faith, is supposed to pay for whatever healthcare services you received retrospectively. Now, it's very expensive. Health insurance companies probably still gonna make money out of you. And another good thing is that it's not really restricted by network. Uh, it can be used by any healthcare provider who accepts your fee for service plan. But as long as they accept it, they, 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 the insurance company is actually gonna pay for the healthcare services that you receive. Let's look at the type of health plans uh, Americans have. So for those who have uh, employer-sponsored healthcare coverage, most of us have PPO. This actually is what I have myself. It is provi uh, pre preferred provider organization health plan. So 56% of those Americans that are covered by their employer for health insurance actually have PPO. Uh, close to 20% have a high deductible health plan and health savings account that comes with it. About 16% is, uh, through a, is a health plan, um, an HMO. And then uh, point of service, about 9% and less than 1% uh, are covered by fee-for-service. This is also fast disappearing, obviously because it is quite expensive. Now it's time to talk about and discuss several terminologies, health insurance terminologies. The first one is risk pooling. So I touched on this earlier on. And what happens in risk pooling is that it allows insurers to have a group of people and then they could spread the risk and therefore the cost of coverage becomes somewhat predictable and stable. So you balance a, uh, that group with more low risk and less high risk health members. So you need a healthy and viable risk pool. There should be more young and healthy members in your risk pool, and there should be less elderly and sickly. So the young and the healthy are less likely to use the services, therefore they keep on paying, but they don't use up the funds. 
Uh, you want less elderly and sickly, those that would use the services more, but are also still paying. So in effect, those of low risk basically subsidize those that are at high risk. That's how risk pooling works. And that's how health insurance works. That is the underpinning principle of insurance in general. Underwriting process, in this case, medical underwriting, is the process that health insurance uh, basically decide whether you are a high risk potential member or you're a low risk potential member. And in the past, before Obamacare, this process can basically determine that you're going to be denied coverage. However, there is no more cherry picking. By the way, insurance companies that cherry pick those who are healthy, that's no longer legal with uh, health care reform. Uh, we can't do cherry picking anymore. That is absolutely illegal. That's why you don't really need to divulge uh, your health information when you buy health insurance in the marketplace because the insurance company doesn't need to know whether you're a cancer survivor or you're a high risk. Okay? And, however, this could still be used to determine the cost of the premium. So you may not be denied coverage, but it could determine how much your premium is going to be. Um, it, it does not have that much effect, though, because we are all protected by Obamacare against cherry picking. Adverse selection refers to a risk pool when it is undergoing or having a uh, change in terms of pool membership where it has a disproportionately more members who are in poor health. In other words, they have more people who are at high risk. This results in a death spiral because the risk pool can no longer maintain the viability of the pool because a lot of people are sick and therefore using up the funds and whatever people are contributing towards the risk pool is not enough to cover for those who are in poor health because they are now the majority. And what happens is that in the process of, of uh, death spiral, pre premiums continuously rise. And it's critical for the success of the Affordable Care Act because the marketplaces, when they sell health insurance, this is predicated on the fact that there are going to be more young, healthy people that will sign up. The next term is pre-existing medical condition. So this is also related to what we call cherry picking. A pre-existing medical condition is basically a disease, a disorder, an illness, or a condition that have been diagnosed in a, on a potential member be, be, before he becomes insured. So if this makes you a high risk or somebody considered to be in poor health, and this might, before pre Obamacare, actually disqualify you from being pulled into uh, or being allowed uh, to get healthcare coverage. Um, what does this, uh, uh, what does this result to possibly? Before Obamacare, you could be rejected in the underwriting process, meaning you will be rejected coverage, or you will be given lesser coverage. This could still happen, or you could have a higher premium. But we have our high risk pool, by the way, um, that is also part of Obamacare. And this actually may not matter much after healthcare reform. As a matter of fact, Americans who are on both sides of the ideological political ide ideological spectrum, Democrats, Republicans, uh, progressives, and liberals versus conservatives, they, these people, they all agree that pre-existing medical conditions should not preclude you from receiving coverage. So that's almost politically um, resolved, I must say. Minimum capital requirements is the net, the net worth of any insurer and it is set by the state, meaning before you could operate as a health insurance company in any given state, the state is going to tell you 
first you have to raise this certain amount, meaning you have to have a capital of say five billion dollars. I'm just pulling that out of thin, thin air. But this is meant to protect us because us as members of that health plan, this makes sure that the claims that health providers send to that, uh, submits to the health insurance company, that those claims are going to be paid. Therefore, our the healthcare services that we receive are going to be paid, which then results into us getting continuity of care. Next is the guarantee fund. So gar the guarantee fund is basically a pot of money uh, set aside by the state. And this is funded by insurers who are in business. So the state collects a certain amount of money from, ins from health insurance companies that operate within their state. It is then put in a, a pot of money. And the purpose is just in case any of these health insurance companies go belly up and go out of business, they could still, this money is the one that's going to be used to pay for those claims, those uh, healthcare services that plan members or the insured people of that uh, health insurance company say that went bankrupt, uh, their healthcare services will be, paid, will be paid for or reimbursed through the guarantee fund that is maintained by the state. Next is policy form. The policy is simply your contract. It's a piece of paper. It's a contract between the health insurer, the health insurance company, and you, the insured. And one thing that you need to remember, and that's very important about a policy, is that it stipulates the benefits that is accorded to you, the insured. If you are in a group coverage, this policy form is maintained by your employer. And all of you within that group, within the risk pool, will receive the same uh, benefit. So that's why around October, September, October, uh, you receive this pamphlet from your employer. It gives you your options and then you make the right choices, which, you know, what type of health plan or what type of uh, coverage you need for you and your family, if that applies to you. Now, premiums will be the cost of your coverage, and this is charged by your insurer. Who pays for your premiums? Well, you share it with your employer. Uh, your employer normally shoulders a bigger uh, percentage, and you shoulder a smaller percentage. Your contribution, you could see this in your monthly paycheck, and this is pre-tax, by the way. Now, premiums are determined by the characteristics of the pool. Where, you're, where you belong to. Deductible is the amount uh, that you will owe your health uh, that you will owe your health insurance company for the health services that you, that you receive before your health insurance company starts paying for those healthcare services. So deductibles come to you as a bill from your provider, depending, and it's per service that you receive. So again, another example. And we discussed this in the high deductible health plan. One example is that, <coughs> excuse me, if your deductible is $1,000, your plan won't pay anything until you've met your $1,000 deductible for covered healthcare services. And usually this is for a year. Okay, so that's pretty high. Uh, some deductibles are 500, but if you have a high deductible health plan, it could be as high as $2,000, some even as high as $5,000. Copayment is a fixed amount. This is a form of an out-of-pocket expense. So for example, $15. So if you go see a healthcare provider and you have a copayment of $15, you owe it at POS or point of service. Uh, that means when you actually go to the front desk and register, they will ask for your health care insurance, or, or if they have that information, they will say, a copay is due today uh, for $15. Without, without you even yet being seen by your doctor, you will already be asked for your $15. Now, if you have a flexible spending account, a health savings account, um, you could charge at $15 from that health savings account, regardless of what type of health plan you have, even if it's not a high deductible health plan. If you have a health savings account, you could use it to pay for your copayment. 
Same with coinsurance, you could use your flexible spending account for coinsurance as well. So coinsurance, uh, as opposed to copayment, which is a fixed amount, coinsurance is by percentage. So it is your share of the cost of the health service that you had, and it's the per percentage of the allowed amount, the allowed amount by your health insurer for the healthcare provider to bill them. So it comes to you as a bill from your provider. Coinsurance usually kicks in after you meet your deductible. That is, if you have any deductible. If you do not have any deductible, well and good. Uh, but coinsurance simply means that each time you go see a doctor, if it's 20%, 20% off that allowable amount for that visit is going to come from you. So example, if the health insurance uh, allows an amount for an office visit of $100 and you've already met your deductible or not if you don't have a deductible your coinsurance payment of 20% would be 20 because 20 is 20% 20 of 100 the health insurance company will pay for the $80 you will be charged $20 by the healthcare provider because they're collecting that from you or as they will be collecting the $80 from your health insurance company Out-of-pocket limits, OOPs, so, or this is also the maximum amount of out-of-pocket expenses you can have in a year. So the policy period is usually a year, and once you have reached your out-of-pocket maximum, you will no longer have to have any out-of-pockets. That means 100% will be paid for by your health insurance company. So take note of this. Out of pocket includes your deductibles, your coinsurance, your copayments, or other charges. However, it does not include the premium or the balance billing for non network providers. So if you went to another doctor that is out of network, then that's not included. But premiums are also your own contribution to your healthcare coverage. So that is not part of the out of pocket. All right, and we said that there are specific amounts that's allowed by law. Uh, as of 2018, um, your allowable is 7,350 out of pocket. If you have already spent 7,350 as an individual and it was meant to cover for any of these deductibles, co insurance, co payments, then what happens? The insurance company starts paying for everything, 100%. Okay, now th this doesn't usually happen, especially for healthy individuals. That is why in a risk pool, you want healthy individuals so that as an insurance company, you don't reach up to this point because if everyone in your pool reaches to this point, you end up paying for everything and you lose money as a health insurance company. Now it's different for a health deductible health plan. Um, here this also protects us, this law protects us because the maximum out of pocket is lower uh, than other health plans. EOBs, explanation of benefits. This is a statement sent to you by the health insurance company within two weeks to a month after the medical visit that you, that you had. And it explains several things. It stipulates the medical treatments that you receive or the services that you receive. It also includes information uh, about um, insurer's code for the service, the name or the place that gave the service, the doctor's name, the name of, and includes your name too. It also says the doctor's fee and what the insurance company allows. Uh, so for instance, they may uh, they may, uh, the provider might send a bill of, say, $500, right, to uh, the insurance company. And because you have a PPO and your provider actually agreed to receive a uh, discounted fee, they will, the insurance company says, we'll only pay 250 So you will see that in your EOB, that your doctor actually billed for 500 and that your insurance company only paid for 250 because that is 
what they have agreed to. Now, the balance of 250, is that going to be your responsibility? And the answer is no, that it has nothing to do with you. What you have to pay is if you have a coinsurance or a copayment at the time of the service. Now, the EOB is not a bill, by the way, but it will include the amount that you, as a patient, is responsible for. What will you be responsible for? You will be responsible for coinsurance payments in case your coverage or your health plan requires you to pay, say, 20% of the amount. Now, if there were any claims that were denied, uh, this will include a brief explanation why that happened and how you could start an appeal. Now, if the claims were denied, there is a possibility that your healthcare provider will charge you instead for that. And what you first need to do is to look at uh, a recourse of an appeal. Another thing you need to do is just make sure before you receive any healthcare services and to get assurance from both your insurance company and your provider that it is in fact covered and it will be paid for by the insurance company. Now let's talk about HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. There are four stipulations, general stipulations uh, for HIPAA. And the first is a continuation of your healthcare coverage after you lose your jo job. And unless it's mandated, uh, I mean, it, it happened because you did not pay your premiums. So this, is, uh, this supports and strengthens the COBRA law, which then allows you to be in your employer uh, type of health coverage and the insurance company will not automatically drop you. You have drop you. You have thirty days, and then if you want to continue, you can do so. If you want to continue debt health insurance, you can do so, but it's going to have to come out of your own pocket. So the premiums, which used to be shared by your employer and your employee, is now going to come from out of your pocket. So that might not be a viable option for you. The second stipulation of HIPAA is that. Uh, it sort of supports loss before Obamacare, where it, it, li it limits cherry picking, and we know what cherry picking is. But this is really sort of moot and academic now because, like we said, there's no more cherry picking. It's not allowed by law, and it's fully politically supported by Americans. It's never going to happen. I don't think so, anyway. Uh, there's also a provision that says there should be special enrollment periods for people who change family composition or employment status. What does this mean? This means that, say for instance, an addition in your family happened after November, which is the time you choose your coverage for the following year, insurance companies are, are mandated by law to allow you to add your new member of your family either through adoption or through childbirth. And last but not the least, which is basically the provision that covers that concept which we are most familiar with, which is patient confidentiality. So, and that stipulation is under what we call required administrative simplification. And under this, it says that electronic transmission of any administrative and financial transactions should be standardized and they should be in electronic format. And this form of standardization must maintain privacy of health information. So everything is now electronic, including filing claims, but administrative simplification simply says it should maintain the privacy of patient health information. And this is what we are very familiar with in terms of uh, the HIPAA law. This time, let's discuss quality and managed care organizations. So how is quality monitored and how is it maintained among managed care organizations? These health plans that are being um, uh, run by health insurance companies. So in 1979, 
the American Association of Health Plans was established, and they renamed it in 1990 into the National Committee on Quality Assurance. Today, it is known simply as NCQA. It's an independent, nonprofit organization. It's funded by accreditation service fees by health insurance companies, and the revenues of this nonprofit organization is uh, basically selling quality indicators. Now. It's a compendium, of, compendium on 250 health plans serving about 50 million Americans. So what does NCQA specifically do? There is actually a video after this lecture video uh, by Dr. Atul Gawande, and he explains why NCQA is very important. Accreditation service fees, so both health insurance companies as well as healthcare providers hospitals, clinics, um, want accreditation from NCQA because it basically is a mark of a stamp of quality of approval that you've met quality standards. And one thing that NCQA does is that it offers its services for evaluation and accreditation on a voluntary service. So. If you are a health insurance company, okay, you want to be accredited by NCQA, uh, NCQA will do that for a fee. Now, you could be a health clinic too and you want that, that is fine. But one thing that's good is that if you are, how it works for us consumers is this. If an insurance company is accredited by NCQA, that means they meet certain standards. That's good for us. If a healthcare organization that provides healthcare services is accredited by NCQA, again, that's good for us because they meet certain standards. Now, between the health insurance companies and the healthcare providers, they also want they also want to see that accreditation because if they're going to give their business to this health clinic, they want them to have high standards in terms of quality of care. Also, if you are a health clinic, you'd want to do business with a health insurance company that has members um, that are well taken care of by the insurance companies that they pay for. NCQA maintains this database. It's called HEDIS, Health Plan Employer Data and Information Set. I will show you uh, a data analysis later. We'll go to their website. Uh, what we get out of this data. But basically, it's a standard method for management care organizations to collect health information. It then gets fed into this database that is maintained by NCQA. And it basically reports, you know, how well health insurance companies perform, how, how well health care organizations perform, and things like that. So what it does is uh, this information, by the way, is de-identified. So your healthcare information is protected. These are de-identified healthcare information that they actually uh, maintain. So as a result, because of the database, uh, health information becomes transparent. And it could be shared across the board, and everybody knows the quality of care that we receive in the United States. Well, NCQA is just one of those air, uh, organizations that collect this information, but it's given the fact that most Americans have coverage through group insurance, through employer-sponsored health insurance, this is big. That, that means they capture a wider range, wide range of healthcare information. They even cover people that are covered under Medicare and Medicaid services because Medicare and Medicaid contracts out with insurance companies. For instance, you could be on Medicaid, but your health insurance card is Health First because Health First is being paid by Medicaid to give you that coverage. So let's go to their website, and I'm just going to show you an example of how this data is being used. There we go. NCQA. This is their annual report for 2017, the state of healthcare quality. Let's look at two particular measures. Let's go down to chronic 
condition management. Uh, let's look at controlling high blood pressure. So it says here 18 to 85 years of age who are, who are diagnosed with hypertension, those with uh, diagnosis of high blood pressure. How many of these people who are covered by this group insurance have a blood pressure in the last reading that is less than 140 over 90? Less than 140 systolic and 90 diastolic millimeters mercury. Now it matters because high blood pressure is considered a silent killer. Uh, we all know that high, high blood pressure, uh, you know, you could be a ticking time bomb if you don't know that you have high blood pressure. But let's look at this. This is where the data comes in, where HEDIS comes in. According to HEDIS, for commercial, for people covered under commercial plans, 62.2% of those who have an HMO that are hypertensives, 62.2% have controlled high blood pressure. About 54%, which is lesser than a PPO. This is really interesting because it tells you if managed care is tightly knit, you might actually achieve uh, better outcomes. Now for PPO, 54% have their blood pressure controlled for Medicaid and Medicare, so on and so forth. And this is really good because these are HMOs under Medicare programs, about 70%. In the meantime, for HMO Medicaid, it's about uh, 57%. Now let's look another, at another measure and let's do it for pediatrics. Uh, let's do weight assessment. So what is this about? How many children aged 3 to 17 at their last outpatient visit had been assessed for BMI percentile documentation? Now for kids, we use percentile because we don't use regular BMI. That's for adults. Percentile because we then compare kids based on their age and um, gender. Uh, we compare them uh to the rest of the population for instance a five-year-old female will be compared to other five-year-old females uh, it's not an absolute number for a bmi so the measure is did they receive counseling for nutrition in addition to having documentation of their bmi percentile not only that did they receive uh counseling for physical activity and let's look at the results it's actually not bad. So for commercial, about 70% met the recommendation. Uh, PPO, again, lags behind. And this is really interesting. And for Medicaid HMO, about 72.5%. So that's it. Uh, you can visit this website if you want to take a look at um, the other measures. It's the end of this lecture. And uh, you will then watch the other resources.